Welcome to Both Sides TV. I'm excited to have a longtime Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Ross Mayfield, here today. Most recently was running business development uh, for SlideShare after the acquisition of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go back, so thank you very much yeah. for coming down. It's great to come down and see you, Mark. It's yeah. good to see you in Los Angeles, yeah. get you out of your home territory, yeah. although you went to UCLA. Right, just around the corner. So this is uh, uh, a familiar territory. Mm -hmm. You are a longtime Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You have been around for a long time through the 90s, but I want to pick up in 2002, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Sure. And if you want, we could go back later. Yeah. But 2002 in Silicon Valley right. is an era that anyone who wasn't around just won't recognize. Right. It's an era in which investors wouldn't return phone calls. Mm -hmm. Journalists, if they were still employed, didn't mm -hmm. even want to write stories. Right. Everyone was so cynical right. from the dot-com era of 97 through 2001. Mm -hmm. right. Describe what it was like, and right. then we'll go into the creation of exactly. your company. So they're really hard but good times. Uh, what you ended up having was, you know, after the bubble, of course, the entire valley was decimated. You saw that happen again later, but um, in a real different way. All funding had completely stopped. A lot of the entrepreneurial activity hadn't really been getting going. Um, what was interesting was that um, that was the time when you had social software come along. So right. uh, first on the consumer side, you ended up having uh, principally blogging, which you got involved in and yep. use, using yep. very early, just mm -hmm. as I was. Yeah, uh, I'm not putting the, as much time into or any time into it as a you know uh, in the way that I used to. Yeah. Um, uh, but what was interesting is you had these very lightweight web native tools that people were creating more to kind of scratch their own itches as things that they could see as something they would use. Right. Yep. Uh, so when Evan Williams created Pyra, um, mm -hmm. which uh, Pyra initially was a project management uh, solution, so right. a, a kind of application we know about. Yep. Um, but him and Meg were working, uh, they ended up creating uh, a blogging tool that were, they were using uh, just as a quick hack to be able to share notes on the inside as they were working on building this larger software product. Right. And at a certain point, he adapted that for use publicly on the web. Um, you know, later, P Peter Merholz called it blogging or blog, you know. Uh, right. You know, web shortened weblog to blog. Yeah. Um, and you know what was interesting is Wasn't a lot it, of was it Cal Canis that had weblogs Inc. He or? had weblogs Inc. Later. Okay. Right? Um, yeah. And uh, and it, there's a lot of blogging history in it. The but but the point was that the tool makers first started to make these things to solve kind of their own problems. Right. But but if I could yeah. stop you for just one second, yeah. and I promise I'll pick up here, but. Mm -hmm. In the era of 98, 99, 2000, and right. into 2001, mm -hmm. we had gone from the 90s in which Silicon Valley was really dominated by engineers and software people. Right. And then suddenly we had the influx of MBAs. Mm -hmm. And everyone wanted to be an entrepreneur. Right. Very few of them had skills. And mm -hmm. every idea was done to 11. Right. So, I mean, famously in the mm -hmm. pet category, there were 10 or 11 people and the right. sock puppet and the millions. Mm -hmm. And it ended overnight. Mm -hmm. And I would say it started with uh, mm -hmm. February, March 2000, right. the correction in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And it was punctured September 11th. Right. And anyone of 2001 and yeah. anyone who had anything in the hopper that wasn't mm -hmm either profitable or near profitable right. or doing well, just yeah, shut down overnight, dead. right? Yeah. So September right. 11th, mm -hmm. 2001. Yeah. So 2002, <laughs> where were all these people? Right. Did they move back to Cleveland? So all or? the MBAs went back to New York, okay. right? Um, definitively. I mean, I had my bubble company, Rate Exchange. Yep. We were B2B exchange trading telecom capacity. Yeah, in what um, year? Uh, and this was, you know, 98, 99, you know, um, uh, 2000, right? Okay. And so when the market started to crash... And you yeah. you mentioned mm -hmm. that you used mechanisms to mm -hmm. actually become a public company. So right. it so was a public company. So what we actually did, um, uh, the investment that we got ended up um, being part of a shell that was doing an ISP roll-up. Okay. They ended up what, and was publicly listed as an over-the-counter stock, right. right? Just so they could perform the roll-up on it. They had us and one other company, uh, which was uh, a co-location play. Uh, for they started to realize, you know, this ISP strategy isn't necessarily the right one. But then all of a sudden, the stock that we had, this little tiny over the counter stock, uh, went from, you know, cents on the dollar to six bucks in a matter of like three things. And just so people yeah. understand it, because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what yeah. over the counter stocks are right. or penny stocks are, I mean, right. they. 
they seem like they're public, but they have right. almost no trading volume right. usually, right? Exactly. There's a lot less liquidity, mm -hmm. a little bit less in the way of um, uh, constraints, regulatory oversight, those kinds of things. So right? it's not like so, being on the New York Stock Exchange or the right. NASDAQ. Right, it's, no. And it's it, almost but, Wild West it, in it a little is, way. It is definitely Wild West. Um, and But all, on the other hand, there's tons of, let's say, commodities over the counter that are over-the-counter um, markets as well. Right. In fact, that's what we created with Rate Exchange. Okay. We created an over-the-counter market for trading bandwidth right. and bandwidth as a derivative. So okay. initially, we started the simple side of uh, my co-founder worked in te wholesale telecom, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, I'm just going to create a website where people can offer to buy and offer to sell wholesale telephony minutes. Okay. Right? So at the beginning of that, it was you know a phone call from one Wilshire over here right. uh, to Hong Kong was six was um, it was uh, six bucks a minute, right. um, and then you know within three years it ended up falling down into the penny area. Right. Um, but the point was initially we just saw hey there's a real problem there's a market that's inefficient because it doesn't have enough transparency and we can broker better than phone brokers who are actually and, doing it. And it was public, so asking mm -hmm. you your revenue is not. Right. So, so oh, oh, no, 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 but here, here's a, it is. Um, so the, the, the end of the story. So we ended up having a company that then realized, you know, B2B became the hottest sector. Yeah. Telecom was on a tear like yep, crazy. I remember. Um, we ended up having Enron come into the market, wanting to turn bandwidth into a derivative right. to help people manage risk. Right. Uh, and, and they came and gave you accounting advice? Uh, no, no. <laughs> but they, they became um, our largest customer. Okay. So, uh, and... We ended up working on like contract standardization, a lot of a lot of things like that for the market, right? Okay. Uh, at the end of it, we had a billion dollars in. Well, so we did. Um, uh, we ended up raising a, a pipe, a public investment in private equity of thirty-five right. million. We okay. did ten million in venture debt. Okay. Then for our capitalization, we met the listing requirement for the American Stock Exchange. Okay. At the height of the bubble, we had a billion dollar market cap and sixty thousand dollars in revenue, which Jesus. is. Makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, it all went up as fast. It went up real fast, and it yeah. went down real fast. Um, our top customers were Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco. Lovely. So that's the trifecta there. Um, you, your fourth yeah. customer should have been Arthur Anderson. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in the end, so that crash, and, and I step back from everything. Um, and at that time, literally, I was trying to figure out, okay, do I want to start another company? What do I want to do? And I got into blogging because it was interesting. Um, it, the point was at that time, um, you know, there was no way to real really start a company, the, the, right? Yeah, and and so the reason I'm trying to focus a little bit on what life le was like in mm -hmm. 2002 is I think if you're newer in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. maybe you started in 08, 09, 2010. Right. It was pretty sleepy back in 2002 because right. the parties ended mm -hmm. and the venture mm -hmm. capital ended and right. people were pretty despondent. Right. MBAs moved home. Mm -hmm. You know, walking around Palo Alto, it was kind of a sleepy town. It was mm -hmm. there were no like Mark Andreessen rock stars walking around right. type right. people, right? And in fact, you know, the people who had made a lot of money and were the angel investors that fueled the beginning of a lot of companies yeah. before the bubble really started to get going, um, they all took a massive hit, right? right? So there was no angel market like right now. It's completely institutionalized, yeah. right? Um, and you have you know new crowdfunding vehicles, you know, angel lists and everything else like that. Raising money for an entrepreneur is not hard right now, right? right? Um, you know, you got to have a decent team, mm -hmm. um, but people take bets on kids all yeah, the time. Sure. Uh, you know, you have to have a decent idea that is going after a really large market where failure is good enough. Right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, back then, so literally for us, what we ended up doing was I, I founded the company with three other people. Mm -hmm. Initially, we did the smart thing was to say, all right, let's just focus on this only for four months. So let's mm -hmm. build product. Um, what we ended up doing in one what, what yeah. month in 2002 so actually it was December 2002 okay. was when we started so the very end in January we had our first product available and okay. in February we had customers paying for it and was it called social text it was the called start? social text from the start okay right? um, uh, you were the CEO from I was the, start? the CEO co-founder and I had three other co-founders so right? it was four of you total yeah exactly and did you split equity 25% each? I split it evenly because I yeah. said well you know what would be most fair Right, yeah. and I wanted to make sure that I had nice balance and harmony and all these other. And things. do you think that's a good idea? I mean, should if mm -hmm. is four co-founders twenty five percent right. each good? Or I don't think when you're dis it's a hard decision about you know how you should you allocate between founders. Right, yeah. there isn't a lot that you can truly benchmark benchmark on. 
although you should be benchmarking towards the roles that you'll yeah. end up playing, the contribution you will make, but that's also relatively hard, um, hard to predict, right? Mm -hmm. What I do recommend is, you know, number one, I do think that there should be a relative tiering. Uh, I wouldn't split it totally equally. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that, you know, and, and it sounds a little, you know, self-serving because I play the role of the CEO guy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that you are starting to set an effect, an equity structure that's going to be reflected in the equity structure for employees too. Right. And you're not going to give everybody an equal share necessarily. Sure. Right. Um, but the other thing is I don't think it's worth fighting too much with your founders about it. You okay. don't want to, you know, start things off on the wrong foot, create tensions in the wrong way. And so you need to try to come to what would be a basic agreement um, and to make sure everyone is, you know, believes in what they're doing. Because that commitment at the beginning, which is based on just equity, not pay, yeah. not anything else, that commitment is the sweat that fuels everything. Sure. What did you imagine in December 2002 social text was going mm -hmm. to become? What problem did mm -hmm. you see in the market? Why did right. you start it? Um, well, it's funny. At the beginning, we were having discussions about, okay, we wanted to do social software, and this was very early days, so that only meant there was wikis and weblogs. This is right. before ne social networking, really, yeah. um, before microblogging, you know, activity streams, everything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we had a lot of debate about should we start an enterprise blogging company, uh, right. and I really liked that idea. Uh, Pete Kaminsky, my CTO, said, okay, well, wait a minute, let me take a look at this wiki, you know, let me show you what a wiki is, mm -hmm. and how a group of people could use it, so then, let's say, in a company, you'd be doing more than publishing in a push-button way. Right. Um, we ended up coming to, together, deciding, okay, there's an opportunity for a wiki company right. as a lightweight, web-native way um, to provide collaboration that's simple, um, less structured and complex. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of the founding moment was when Pete and I were at the Kevin Werbach Supernova conference, okay. and we saw this panel of traditional collaboration vendors. And you know, in 2002, the only things that were getting funded were um, security, mm -hmm. fear, risk, compliance. Right. right? right. Um, you know, the most active, uh, I think, in, in, you know, investor at that time was InQtel, a CIA-backed arm. Right. Okay. Um, so, you know, what it, it, these guys were sitting here talking about process and structure and rules and heavy enterprise below. And in the middle of it, you know, Doc Searles stood up and said, what are you guys talking about? Right now, you know, Dan Gilmore just blog, live blogged this session. We're sitting here on AIM doing, you know, chatting and having conversation, you know, and actually collaborating in a real lightweight way. And, you know, after that, Pete and I got a cup of coffee and said, okay, this thing we've been talking about, there's really something there, uh, something that is simpler, lightweight, and could actually solve some problems in ways that the bigger players weren't, you know, the IBMs uh, with Lotus and everything, right? Okay. Um, so it was just that real basic founding idea of adapting <clears throat> something that was existing on the consumer web. Keep in mind, Wikipedia started one year before okay. uh, for use inside of the enterprise, right? Um, so, you know, from there, the way that, now the funny thing is, Initially, I thought I was founding a wiki company and a wiki was the end all be all. Yeah. We did a great job as the first in a category, kind of creating a category that people later would know as Enterprise 2.0. Yeah. Um, I don't think that I had the right vision in not really realizing how fast this could grow to an all encompassing suite of tools, right? Okay. Where an enterprise buyer would want the ability to have a collaborative wiki, um, profiles, and social networking. Uh, a layer for conversation in more of a microblogging fashion and a lot of other things in the feature set. Probably could have gone a lot more aggressive uh, in breadth. Um, when, you know. when did you raise your first round of mm -hmm. capital from institutional so, yeah. investors? So uh, it ended up taking, so even though we started getting revenue in like month three, mm -hmm. um, and we were starting to generate decent revenue with some decent initial customers, it was really hard because mm -hmm. you know I had had one company before, but you know we weren't proven entrepreneurs in the same kind of brand or anything like that. S to put you things know. into context, mm -hmm. Salesforce.com was not even public; it was right. a privately traded company. Exactly. Uh, the idea that you were going to create <clears throat> SaaS publicly traded companies was right. heresy. Yeah. And uh, I think there was a lot of cynicism for mm -hmm. enterprise software in general. Right. Right. At that point, both for enterprise and consumer, at right, that moment in 2002, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, kind of a little bit of the starting watershed moments that happened in the full space really were, I look at the moment in which um, Google acquired Blogger, mm -hmm. that's when the Valley kind of woke up to social software. 
But before that... Do you remember that, what year that was? I think that's too late 2003. Um, okay. It's hard to say. Um, okay. But anyway, so I ended up being able, um, you know, six months in, we finally closed an angel round. And it was relatively small. Okay. But it was with a lot of people that a lot of people came to know very well. Okay. So Reed Hoffman. Yeah. I uh, founded LinkedIn. Mark, small guy. Yeah, never heard of him. Never heard of yeah. him. Uh, Joey Ito. Yeah. Mark Pincus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pierre Lu Luigi Zappacosta, the founder of Logitech. But, you know, some of the early people involved in the creation later yeah. of all of social software and social networking. It's interesting. Right? I mean, Reed, Mark Pincus, Joey Ito, none of them were big deals back right. then, really. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we brought in Loic Lemur uh, okay. as well, yeah. right? Uh, and it was one of his first investments as he was starting to. Okay. And move he was on doing over. Six Apart? Back uh, then? He, and this was pre Six Apart. Okay. Uh, or he had his own independent uh, blogging company okay. that he sold the front. Uh, six apart okay um, so but in any way uh, we did that and then we ended up bringing in uh, Omidyar Networks okay. uh, here Omidyar's fund okay we were their first for uh, profit investment uh, initially and he back started then that. at Omidyar I think mm -hmm. Rob Hayes was at Omidyar mm -hmm. Rob Hayes Doug uh, who's now at first round capital yeah. uh, Doug Solomon who's an amazing guy mm -hmm. um, Pierre gathered some really amazing people, right? Yeah. Um, and I had to fly to uh, Las Vegas and meet him outside the Paris uh, casino to try to close the deal. And, and I know it's crazy yeah. to actually have to say this out loud, Ross, but for people who don't know, he founded eBay. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I just think, like, you know, time marches on and right. people kind of don't know the heritage right. of who did what. Yeah. Um, so... You raised this round, mm -hmm. and tell me about your first customers. How did right. you get them? How did you get them to use your right. software? How did you market mm -hmm. yourself? So you have to, we didn't have any money to market ourselves, right? right? Um, and, and you certainly couldn't right. blog because there were no exactly. blogs. And well, it was the beginning of blogs, okay. and that actually was a real good thing. Okay. Um, so uh, the first mechanism, and it's the one that I, I think entrepreneurs underuse these days, yeah. is we create an amazing advisory board, okay. right? So. Uh, we ended up getting, and part of it was we wanted real thought leaders in this new space of social software. So we had Clay Shirky, Kevin Werbach, Jerry Mikowski, Doc Searles, David Weinberger, you know, like half of the Clue Train uh, manifesto. You should uh, look up who those people yeah, are. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, Ward Cunningham, who yeah. founded the, you know, who created the wiki in the first place, right? Yeah. Um, later we had Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia on our board, um, okay. on our uh, board of directors. but. The, uh, Mitch Radcliffe, a couple other so, people. So give yeah. a, qu a quick aside, Ross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you recommend people set up Board of Advisors? Because right. my observation is the mm -hmm. overwhelming majority of companies that I see that have Board of Advisors don't really get any value right. out of it. And they end up giving up equity. And it right. really, what, what it mostly becomes is something to put in your slide deck to raise money to mm -hmm. say, I have all these important Names. people on yeah. my Board of Advisors. But... Right. I I actually have ideas, but I'd love yeah. to hear from you. How did you get value? You said it was valuable. So throughout the structure, okay, it's you're taking some of your equity and you are investing in, in something, and you need to get something back whenever you do that, right? Okay. Um, the structure that I uh, it was actually what was it, Covad originally, mm -hmm. an ISP. Yeah, um, Covad. I heard about uh, their model and mm -hmm. stole it. Um, okay. And they uh, competed against rhythms, I think. I think so. Yeah. I mean, now we're in the early, you know, mid 90s. Yeah. Uh, but the, so anyway, it, essentially what it is is um, every member of the board of advisors has to be available for one point of contact, the CEO, to okay. answer emails, take some phone calls, okay. maybe give a favor. But the structured part of it is uh, uh, every, um, every month there's a call, mm -hmm. uh, and once a quarter you do a meeting face to face if you can. Okay. Um, for the call, what we ended up alternating on was um, the company would take a turn presenting on a strategic issue and trying to get strategic advice. And then on the next call, we'd have an advisor come and present on a strategic issue or a technology trend or something new that really the they think the company should be paying attention to. Yeah. Have the half of the call be you know presenting and the other half of it discussing. Okay. The um, but the value that we got was not just in really great thoughts and good guidance, um, but uh, you know I ended up getting my bet you know some of my first recruits uh, definitively my. Um, uh, our first sales came right. from warm introductions from those advisors. And initially when you've got nothing, you know, a startup is initially you're making stone soup. Right. right. You put a stone in the pot and a little water. You stir it and pretend you have something really cooking. Right. Someone comes by and goes, oh, what are you making? And you say, hey, you throw in a carrot here. Yeah. Um, we're making some soup. And then yeah. another guy comes by with celery and so forth and so forth. 
the point was uh, initially your first sales, if it's on the enterprise side, it's going to be driven by relationship. It's going to be driven by the buyer, maybe believing in, vi in the vision of what the product is going to be, but it's really going to have confidence in investing in a person. So I right? uh, totally agree. And I want to come on to enterprise sales, but yeah. I want to make a few points if I could about um, advisory boards. Number mm -hmm. one, at least so people know, mm -hmm. the standard, it's about 0.25% mm -hmm. for an advisor. Is that right. roughly your... So I overpaid in the past, Okay, but I have heard that. I number. think market is about yeah. 0.25. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I always give the exact same advice on board of advisors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can have vesting, and usually mm -hmm. it's two-year vesting for board of advisors. Right. Do not assume you will get a single share back. Right. Because if you go on the assumption that your board of advisors are important people, right. then even if they don't contribute what you expected, mm -hmm. the bad will from getting like right. you know 0.065% back is not worth the right. hassle. Yeah. So if you're don't give it lightly, mm -hmm. but if you're gonna give it, just assume right. it's gone, it's spent. Now, mm -hmm. what I always tell people is the best way to get value out of a board of advisors is to have meetings, yeah. like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And what they should want to get out of their relationship with you a little bit is mm -hmm. interaction with the other board of advisor Definitely. members, right? Yeah. And you want to build this cohesive group that sort of feels proud to be working together and right. working with you. If it's simply people to respond to emails, A, you won't get that much value, mm -hmm. and B, you could do that without them being yeah. board of advisors. Yeah. So I think the real value, and you almost have to be good mm -hmm. at facilitating group meetings, right. have a dinner, yeah. and just pay for a nice mm -hmm. enough dinner. Right. Always have your dinners in private rooms, right. never in public areas, mm -hmm. and lead a discussion mm -hmm. amongst this group. Yeah. And, the, and, and I actually would probably go for twice a year, because mm -hmm. four times a year, it's hard to get people in right. these busy times to four times a year. So twice yeah. a year, small group, probably no more than six people sitting mm -hmm. around a table and bring up strategic topics like be vulnerable mm -hmm. and say, right. look, here's what I'm working through. Um, I'm struggling to get along with my co-founder and mm -hmm. I don't know what to do about it. Can right. we talk about that? And have like important talks. Yeah. And the funny thing is the more you ask them for help, mm -hmm. the more they'll feel affinity with you. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's great advice. Um, I think the only trick in it also is um, they're, the, or the more you have them engaged, the more that they're going to be ambassadors. And typically, you know, these are the more they're going to be what's ambassadors. Right? Ambassadors, right? yeah. Uh, they're, um, and so also, especially if a, pro a product that you can have them use, mm -hmm. that's going to be absolutely the best way of kind of keeping and continually involving them, right? Yeah. There's a benefit, of course, if you're making collaboration software, that's really u easy. Um, yeah. A lot of the consumer stuff, right? Um, you know, because part of it is these are really busy people who happen to be pretty well connected and yeah. off doing different things, speaking at different conferences. Uh, the more that you have other people speaking about you and being your ambassador for an introduction, sure. you know, the better, right? Yeah. So talk about your first sales. Yeah. How did you get your first clients? What what did mm -hmm. they want to achieve? What right. were they trying to do with social collaboration? So we somewhere? had the benefit of um, some of the market education wasn't necessary because mm -hmm. the first people we'd sell to were people who were using the consumer tools, okay. right? So somebody who was active in blogging or on an early social network called Rise that predated Friendster sure. and so forth, right? Um, and so by you know tapping our first place that we were tar tapping was people were already kind of naturally gravitating towards those kinds of tools on mm -hmm. their own. And the thing that you saw later in social media uh, mm -hmm. sales and all is you'll have some people who for some reason about social software, they get hyper enthusiastic, right? So they can end up being great ambassadors inside of a company. Right. They may not be, you know, the economic decision maker, the IT gatekeeper, the, you know, other more pivotal roles, but they really will drive it as a champion, right? So what were mm -hmm. they using it for? What problem right. were they solving? Why were they, was it the IT mm -hmm. department? Was right. it? So the initial core use case of this ended up being project communication, okay. right? So. Uh, you were a product manager yeah. before. Mm -hmm. The role of a product manager is as an information hub, sure. right? Uh, yes, you're trying to keep the schedule and try to talk through very, you know, all kinds of details. Um, but more than anything, you're communicating to all stakeholders to keep them consistently aligned and executing on a vision, right? Yeah. Um, that communicate, you know, before wikis, uh, a lot of it would be there'd be an emailed attachments right. that happen to be PRDs, really, you know, 20, 30 page over specified documents, right? Uh -huh. And by the way, when we started social text, that was, you know, we started with an agile development method. 
still back then it was relatively rare mm -hmm. and we ended up developing some of the better practices for distributed agile um, because we had a distributed team um, yeah. through the course of let's call it 2002 to 2006 mm -hmm. who were some of the bigger clients you had and mm -hmm. what kind of impact do you think you well, had I'll say so we ended up we had some good name brands yeah. I'll say the pivotal ones that we had like very early on having you know a guy named Charles Warren at I when he was at IDEO uh, mm -hmm. really made a, a big dent for us mm -hmm. BJ Fogg with his class at Stanford mm -hmm. you know was our first thing but just initially having living human beings banging on it was mm -hmm. a big deal mm -hmm. when we started to get into increasing referenceability I'd say there were two really key customers for us mm -hmm. um, one was Symantec mm -hmm. um, uh, and the other was Dresner, Kleiner, Wasserstein. Right. For Symantec, what it was is we ended up having to go through the hurdles of getting our software bulletproof enough that we could deploy to a company that sells security software. Mm -hmm. It forced a learning process for us that maybe it was a little too early for SaaS. Mm -hmm. um, what we ended up creating was a pre-configured hardware appliance mm -hmm. where we deploy our SaaS software on it and it would run inside the intranet. Okay. Later, we figured out a way um, through, uh, well, forget the details on it, um, through an Ubuntu distribution method of being able to have that software be remotely update, updated, right? Okay. That let us run a network of hundreds and hundreds of servers behind firewalls um, and in our own hosting center where we'd run a single image of the software, so it's still pure SaaS, mm -hmm. uh, and with continual updates, right? Um, but that ended up taking us, in effect, into a different market. We ended up selling... Um, you know, one of our uh, appliances, I believe, is still running in the Pentagon right now. They, they use it for a, a vaccination uh, program for the Army, right? right. Um, the other one that I think is was maybe the most pivotal, uh, which was um, J.P. Ringaswamy. Mm -hmm. um, who I was going to ask if he was your client. Yeah, exactly. So J.P., who I met he when... was Because I, I, he was living in London right. when I was in London. Yeah. And he was Mr. Run Around Town telling everyone how much he loves wikis. Right. Um, that's, uh, there's your ambassador right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, JP uh, was the CIO at uh, a bank in London at mm -hmm. the time. Um, I met him by being on a panel at one of Kevin Werbach's events mm -hmm. uh, and we got to talking and he was completely, you know, way ahead of the curve of a lot of CIOs and the vision of where mm -hmm. this stuff could go. Um, and, uh, and he got it immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And so with JP, I, as an entrepreneur, learned a lot about when you're selling into these organizations, even though you're selling from the top down with the CIO, mm -hmm. the way that even that CIO needs to manage uh, the interests that all of the employees may have about using different tool sets and not having to be you know, hard and clamp down and say, no, everyone is using this, but really kind of earn it when you have things like an open source wiki that some people are using, another preferred collaboration tool. And so we had to fight a little bit of a battle internally to get up to the point where it was like, okay, now we're going to go do something that's an enterprise-wide deployment and really yeah. earn it and structure it. But a last quick point yeah, on it. Sure. What this forced us to do was we had to deal with scale for the okay. first time. And this was um, a lot of entrepreneurs are going to have this make or break moment where it's like, okay, do we take this customer that could be marquee, it's going to be more revenue, but it's having us... Um, start engineering to support something at a different scale. And what that means if we do it is a lot of our engineering efforts are always going to be dedicated at uh, that level as opposed to brand new shiny features that the market may want in different ways, right? right. Um, so it almost killed us to be able to develop that, to launch it, to um, provide the level of support that was needed. Um, for a, a bank that's on the other side of the world, you know, pagers going off in the middle of the night and yep. things like that. A lot of fire drills, we made it through, we became a stronger company uh, that really got us to the point where, you know, it, it was all, as it always is, raising your average selling price that mm -hmm. starts at, you know, will you pay us $50 you right. know, to, you know, $1,000 licenses, 10, 25, and then getting up to the six figure plus where you really get great economics. Do you remember someone named Ishmael Galimi? Yeah. So Ishmael had created a conference called Enterprise 2.0. Office 2.0. Was it Office 2.0? Yeah. Office 2.0. Ishmael turned his blog into a conference that ended up making a lot of sponsorship money and having a lot of hyped interest around something that was closer to personal productivity yeah. uh, and a little bit more consumer collaboration. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was a great event in the heyday. I remember that era. I presented mm -hmm. there. I spoke yeah. on a panel. I remember that was the birth of Rightly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Rightly was born around that time. It became mm -hmm. Google Docs. Uh -huh. 
There was social text. I had a startup in that era. There were a lot of us starting enterprise companies that were trying to borrow from consumer and launch enterprise companies. Right. And social text was a very well-known company mm -hmm. in that era. At least it was well-known amongst our peer group. Mm -hmm. um, what lessons do you have about, mm -hmm. in some ways I could say, you didn't get to that next level. Right. I didn't either. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what would you have done differently? Would, um, mm -hmm. Did the market change around you and you didn't spot some of right. those changes? Uh, were you, had you raised too much capital? Were yeah. you too embedded and had to serve the customers and product mm -hmm. you have? Like what right. would you, what would you advise you know, the, the younger Ross to right. have done? So I worked on it for eight years and made lots of mistakes, yeah. right? So I could write a book on the mistakes and what was learned from it. But some of the bigger ones uh, that affected the outcome for the company, um, I would say that there- And, and I'm sorry, yeah. I just want to say before you, um, I know you did a lot of things right, so I'm yeah. not trying to turn on the negative, no, no. but I think people learn more from yeah. being able to reflect on what didn't quite. Yeah. You know, I'm hell all the time, yeah. comfortable with that. Yeah, so because guys like Jive Software, they were right. around forever too, and yeah. somehow I don't know how they got right. to the next level. So a lot of what ended up happening in the space was, um, I can say that um, we started the space, we created a category. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be the first person in. It's much better to be the second, third others where some of the positionings there, some of the things that you can learn from are already there. Yeah. Um, and uh, and especially if you start in like 2002 where you're like barely scraping together a little bit of capital just to make shit, sell shit, and satisfy customers. Yeah. The three essentials of actually doing a real business. Yeah. Um, you know, we were able to get it to the point where, you know, it did become a Silicon Valley darling. Uh -huh. We attracted a lot of competition. I mean, that, Wiki was, mm -hmm. this, uh, I would, right. synonymous with social mm -hmm. tax right. or at least business Wiki, yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. And we did have, we attracted others like JotSpot um, mm -hmm. that was sold to Google. Mm -hmm. uh, Atlassian mm -hmm. uh, created a Wiki product course, that did very yeah. well. Confluence was Confluence. It? Um, and, uh, but it was a really large market. And, uh, and so we would say we maintained thought leadership and... Um, because of differences in business model, I'd say, uh, we ended up having, you know, we, fed, we fought some really tough competition. So when Atlassian was coming in, marketing through Jira, through its base of Java developers, mm -hmm. uh, at, a, at a cost of only 5,000 uh, bucks for a server license, mm -hmm. you could enterprise do an enterprise-wide deployment. Right, we and Jira was bug tracking. Bug tracking, So right. they started with bug tracking, because right. <clears throat> we were Jira users, yeah. and then they came out with this product, Confluence, mm -hmm. And that's how I knew about it because all of my developers thought, well, we're already using Jira, we might as right. well use this product. Exactly. So we ended up having to find ways of adding, of making sure that we were delivering more value mm -hmm. uh, than Atlassian to be able to sustain the average selling prices that we wanted for our model, mm -hmm. even though we were relatively low cost SaaS and you know this appliance distribution. Um, and and I think we did ended up doing a real good job. I'd say. Mm -hmm mistakes towards it was we started to get a little bit greedy mm -hmm. and pay a little bit too much into Silicon Valley hype on one thing that ended up being a strategic distraction. So mm -hmm. uh, around that time, it wasn't just SaaS, um, but you know, people exploring hybrid open source mm -hmm. as a business model. So sure. we made the mistake of thinking, okay, we develop software in this way. We really have the right ethics and we do believe in the distribution model where we'd like people to go and take our technology, start using it, maybe adapt, maybe contribute back, mostly look at it as a distribution opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to go for greater market share. Um, yeah. And it ended up not being as natural a fit because we weren't, you know, it's much easier, or I, I put it this way, the, biz if you, the business model you start with is the best one to end up with, right? Okay. If you start, like let's say SlideShare, mm -hmm. started off with it's free and we're doing some ads, mm -hmm. right? To then layering on freemium on top of that was really hard for average users to see and it was harder to draw lines on things like let's say usage levels. Like what if we said you couldn't upload more than five presentations for free? You couldn't do that to something that had already grown to 60 million unique visitors a month. Right. Um, the, uh, you know, so, but with social tax, you know, we had a different business model uh, than the hybrid open source. Trying both on, you know, remaking the code base something distributable was a huge distraction, kept us away from making new features instead. Uh, and making the business model shift, it ended up being hard to execute. There's right? an interesting lesson that mm -hmm. I'm taking away, which mm -hmm. is something I've seen in many companies. And I'll describe it maybe differently than the experience you had. But mm -hmm. I get asked the question all the time by SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, I built this software. 
I'm serving it up as a SaaS model, meaning I host it and you use it through your web browser or maybe a thin client. Right. But I've got these really large customers that have big needs and security concerns and they want their own instance of the software. Right. Mm -hmm. So then you start building right. uh, an application server for them where it can right. run inside. And then mm -hmm. some people want hybrid models. And right. I've seen people anywhere from an appliance right. to I'll sell you an enterprise license that you mm -hmm. run, right. told them myself. And it's so hard to succeed at any software company. And right. even as you get up to 10, 15, 20 million dollars, 25 million dollars in revenue, mm -hmm. as I started to do in my first company, competition changes everything all the time. And yeah. to the extent that you spread your bets mm -hmm. across different platforms, right. I think your ability to respond goes down significantly. Mm -hmm. So if I look back, I say, what Mark Benioff, the genius of mm -hmm. Benioff. I mean, right. there's a lot of genius of Benioff. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of obnoxious things of Benioff. But the genius seemed almost like religiously dogmatic. We're only going to do SaaS. You right. want to do client software, go use a right. crappy piece of software like Siebel or something. Right, exactly. Is there some of that in your there's experience? A, a ton of it. Um, yeah. You know, being an entrepreneur is the absence of, is um, the art of working in absence of resources. Mm -hmm the best weapon that you have in that ends up being focus. Mm -hmm. uh, the best products are a result of saying no, yep. not of saying yes. Yeah. If you're on the enterprise side, you're gonna be pulled, there are people who are saying, trying to get you to say yes with dollars sure. that you may think are essential for survival. Yeah. And it may end up detracting you it's like It's the crazy, mistake right? I made in my first company. I yep. said I became a prostitute for money. Mm -hmm. And it was almost fueled by venture capital because I raised so much venture capital that right. they had expectations about me hitting right. quarterly targets. Yeah. And the only way I could really hit my quarter the yeah. targets is okay anything for money right and i think we lost in my mm -hmm. first company our core right we lost our ability to define strategy because we were playing defense to mm -hmm. all the requirements of our customers yeah. rather than just saying i'm sorry this is what we do if right. it's not a good fit for you right you know maybe we'll talk again right. next year exactly and one of the lessons i had to learn for myself as a leader was yeah. i would get attracted about the idea of going off and doing the very next feature mm -hmm. right Part of it because I could see some customers that I would end up selling it into. Yeah. A lot of it also because then I'd be able to talk to the market about something new and be able to keep marketing and keep doing great PR on yeah. um, you know, and, and it, that ended up being a thing that would end up dr distracting on focus as much as possible. So, yeah. you know, sa saying no to my uh, attraction to shiny objects. Yeah. Uh, was something that I had to learn kind of a hard way. It's to. funny, and it's why I often talk about how much I like working with second and third time entrepreneurs mm -hmm. because the shiny objects problem is a real one. Right. I think CEOs meddle mm -hmm. too much in product, mm -hmm. and I learned the hard way. I have a wonderful product manager, a guy mm -hmm. named Tim Barker, who now runs product at a company I invested in called Datasift. Mm -hmm. And he's the first product manager who ever stood up and told me to shut the fuck up. Right. Like, yeah. He said, look, you know what he did? It was right. actually brilliant as he said, okay, we're gonna do portfolio. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm gonna draw a slice and I'm gonna mm -hmm. call it 8% and that 8% is CEO. Right. You can fuck around all you want within right. that 8%, uh -huh. but you only get 8%. Yeah. And any other time you come to my team to ask for, and right. it was almost like, I'm sure he wanted to give me 2%, Right. but it was his way of saying, mm -hmm. you go do all you want on shiny objects, right. but you can't go outside yeah. that box. And it was magnificent and he really, really controlled yeah. me. And I think CEOs meddle too much in product. Right. David Sachs, you know mm -hmm. David? Yeah. David said recently on Twitter, uh, mm -hmm. of course, a famous quote, he said, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Mm -hmm. And he said that the best product managers are dictators. Mm -hmm. And the best you can hope for is that they're benevolent dictators. Right. And I, there's some truth in that, isn't yeah. there? No, there is. Um, and, and I would say, but there is a thing. I think if you're an entrepreneur who's gone through it a couple times, mm -hmm. you start to get a sense of what areas do you end up having a good gut on and yeah. which ones do you not. Right? Sure. Um, and I do think you have to, I mean, there's a lot of traits you have to develop in yourself as a startup CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, again, it is as much knowing what you're good at and what you're not. But right. like I, at this point, I can say that I am more confident in my uh, product gut mm -hmm. than I was before. Sure. Um, the, and that's a part where in some cases I'll actually be stubborn and I'll listen to myself even a little mm -hmm. bit more uh, than... Um, uh, as an input to what would the, be the final decision right. than I would have before. Right. Yeah. My recommendation for mm -hmm. CEOs when you deal with product people, um, first of all, I like CEOs that are 
uh, versed in and have strong opinions on product. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to say that you ought to be trusting your head of product almost mm -hmm. every time. Right. But you have to reserve the right to overrule. Right. Yeah. And so the problem is if you mm -hmm. overrule too often, yeah. you either get a head of product who quits. Right. Because no great head of product is going to stay mm -hmm. when the CEO meddles all right. the time. Or you get a sycophant head of product mm -hmm. and you design your product by camel. Right, right. right. And, uh, and so it's, that, it's a hard balance. Yeah, it is. Um, I'll also say it, it kind of reminds me of another lesson failure you sure. know, from the social text part. Um, because we were doing new generation of collaboration software, a lot of it was we, saw, we thought we could really enable and try leading management practices, mm -hmm. right? Things like moving from hierarchy to heterarchy, mm -hmm. right? Um, a flatter organization. There was one moment where I completely just messed it up, which was um, uh, we were deciding the vacation policy at a certain point, and I said, okay, well, this is a vacation policy, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's get everybody's input in on this. So mm -hmm. what I did was the mistake of saying, okay, guys, we're gonna have an online debate, and you guys can discuss, and I want to make sure that we come up with really good, the best ideas and come up with something that everybody likes. So everyone asked yeah. for the whole summer off? So they, essentially, <laughs> it turned into complete chaos, yeah. right? right? And what ended up happening was productivity for the company just stopped for yeah. a little while. Mm -hmm. And people were more focused on debating openly about things out of kind of their self-interest or more benevolent in some cases, yeah. right? In the end, uh, the mistake was not saying, it's great to open up to discussion, but you have to say, in the end, the decision is going to be made in this way, in within this time and probably with an ability to override if it's just absolutely insane, yeah. right? Um, we ended up with a great policy. It was called Be an Adult, kind of borrowed from Netflix, right. which also meant you know, that you, you, we wouldn't have to pay out vacation time and right. things like that. Um, you know, but it was a real big learning of you, it, in the Valley, you want to experiment with an engineer everything. Yeah. And it's tempting to experiment with very basic known things. In some cases, it's not the best thing to do, right? You eventually either fired yourself or were mm -hmm. fired, and by that I mean you became chairman, right? Yeah, uh, or resigned or right. whatever. I don't, mm -hmm. not a hostile term, but right. how did you know mm -hmm. it was time to change mm -hmm. your role to move into something? Right. So I think every founder has kind of a natural scaling point, mm -hmm. and at least the way I've always looked at it is I want to test that scaling point. Mm -hmm. I measure it more by the number of employees that I have okay. that I'm managing with every single startup. I mean, back in you know, my first startup was um, was a web design company, and you know, I had in just three other people in it, and it was small. And I reached, I felt like I, I, you know, was I testing a scaling point before I moved on to something? No, and I wanted to go more and go more. Um, the you know, at a certain companies change um, a lot. You know, when you start getting at scales of number, you know, the difference of a company of twelve versus fifty versus a hundred versus two fifty are astronomical differences, right? right? Um, the time when I ended up, so I brought in Eugene Lee, uh, who is the CEO of Social Tax after I did it for five years. Mm -hmm. And that was at this wonderful natural scaling point where I, and I, I stuck around, helped with the transition and the recruiting, and then stuck around in an operational role and watching the way that he worked in setting up process discipline um, in a way that I could really respect. Um, being able to get, um, focusing on managing his managing team and make, management team mm -hmm. and making that management team a, a real functional team. Yeah. Um, those are things that I probably would not have invested so much time into. Right. Yeah. Um, so where I'm at now, you know, for my next startup, I don't know what that limit is. It yeah. may be that I could make it to, you know, the mezzanine or public stage. Sure. Uh, I'm going to just keep testing what it is. Right. Um, so you took a different role in the company mm -hmm. in 2006 before you did that you mm -hmm. started advising a little tiny company called SlideShare. Right. How did you get involved with SlideShare? So um, from what I was doing with social uh, with social text and also being an active kind of pundit on the consumer social software side and social networking mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting involved as an advisor with a lot of you know a lot of companies. Um, okay. One of them was uh, SlideShare. Uh, John and Rashmi came to uh, a bar camp and uh, showed, I was the first person to see the first SlideShare demo. Uh, okay. And I said, this is awesome. Uh, call it a YouTube for PowerPoint. I right. ended up calling up Mike Arrington and, uh, and he wrote a blog post and that was like the extent of the marketing that they did, right? Yep. Uh, and John and Rashmi with these, you know, and Ahmed, the other co-founder who's been mm -hmm. running the India side all along and is still there. 
um, you know, with this amazingly uh, tenacious and dedicated, hardworking product folk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all of the credit for the scale in which they were able to achieve, you know, goes to them and the long hours that they had with late night phone calls to India yeah. and a lot more. And, you know, having a good product focus that solves. I mean, initially, it's like back then, there's no way to put a, web, a PowerPoint on a web page. Right. You know, John's insight was they were hosting a bar camp in India and everyone was asking like, hey, how are we going to share the files of all these different presentations? And he couldn't believe there wasn't a tool that ex it didn't exist to do that. It ended, who knew that it could be, grow to be something that's, you know, at the scale that they're at. So. And um, there was around the same time or maybe a little bit later was mm -hmm. Scribd. Right. They so could. Scribd was probably the closest competitor, more focused on docs. They did a lot of the very same tactics, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is it, one of the little lessons. Whatever product you start with is the product you end up with, right? right? Um, if you start doing presentations, adding on documents is something that people won't even realize is necessarily there and vice versa for Scribd, right? Okay. So in the end, the feature set wasn't all that different. I would say... Um, SlideShare focused more, um, it was temptation to get into a lot of features that they resisted very well. Like uh, maybe you want to create the ability to create a PowerPoint presentation on a web uh, app, right? Mm -hmm. um, instead, they really focus on how do we help achieve distribution for the people that posted it, right? right. And have a good experience for doing so. Do which you've done a lot. Thing, yeah. Yeah. Do one thing very well. Mm -hmm. Do one thing real well that scales. And how did you make the decision to join? You eventually joined the company, right? So um, then after I, I'd work on social text for eight years, yeah. ups and downs, I, an answer to a question you asked before was the, the other biggest strategic mistake we made was uh, we were raising money when the Lee, Lehman Brothers collapse happened. Oh, no. Jive and Yammer, who ended up being public or acquired by Microsoft, had capitalized right just before Sequoia put out Rest in Peace Good Times, yeah. right? Um, so, so we ended so the up lesson this is year. always yeah. raise at the right time. Make sure that you're capitalized <laughs> for a nuclear winter. Um, no, but this yeah. is something, Ross. Yeah. It's so hard to tell people this because you never believe that the world is going to change, right? right? You know, I remember '07 mm -hmm. and leading into '08, and right. I had as a venture capitalist, I started in '07, mm -hmm. and back then people used to read the funded mm -hmm. a lot right yeah. for feedback on feces right and uh you know of all the stuff written about me on the funded it was you know reasonably good and then i got one thing that just really bothered me it was a guy who came to see me and he said mark was super smart he spent time really trying to understand my product and you mm -hmm. can see he really wanted to you know get his head around it but he was so cheap on price yeah he ended up raising at a 40 pre on no revenue uh-huh and I just, there was no way I was, and he raised $10 million. Right. A year later, he was bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And that era of right. 07, 08 was so frothy, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's frothy oh, again. Yeah. And it will change, I just don't know when. And when right. it changes, like the VC right. market just shuts down overnight. Yeah. And if you can be prepared, you are in such a wonderful state. I mean, you know what? I, I look forward to the next downturn. I hope it's a slight little dip, honestly. Yep. But what does it mean? I can hire people better, sure. right? If I want to start a company then, there's more people who will do more things prospectively for free because they can't find other right. jobs. I mean, actually blogging and social software, the reason it took off, people were blogging because they were home and unemployed and had nothing else to yeah. do, right? Um, so it creates some weird market opportunities yeah. too. The best but having a marketing are, budget to yeah. spend and, um, and uh, surpass competition during that dip. Yeah. It's a well-known play. It's an amazing place to be, right? The best companies, I think, mm -hmm. are built in yeah. downturns. You yeah. know. But And even better, what's the real goal that you should have, right? Get the company near or at profitability so you control your own destiny. It doesn't mean that you have to raise. Yep. The, the best thing is build an asset that is comfortable at a level while still taking good business risks uh, where, you're, where you feel that... Um, uh, where you can where you can make your own decisions, right? So you miss the funding cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, that obviously hurts because yeah. when the market shut down in September of 08, mm -hmm. they were pretty closed until the middle yeah. of 09, and right. that hurts. In 2010, you mm -hmm. went to Sledger? Or so uh, somewhere around 2010, yeah. I forget exactly. But so what we did with Social Text was we cut it to profitability. Mm -hmm. We got it back growing and hiring again. Uh, we sold it to a company called People Fluent, okay. uh, which is an HR software company. Okay. wasn't a huge home run, right. but it was a good, graceful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we ended up making a little bit of a return mm -hmm. for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. 
but around 2000, uh, well, whenever that happened, um, yeah. I, at that point, I, I'd stepped into a chairman role. And uh, at that point, I was figuring out, do I want to start a company? Who should I be doing this with? And I was advising John and Rashmi and started to help a little bit and getting some uh, getting some of their marketing function going, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a real clear path with them. Um, I saw that I was starting to add some value, stepped in. Um, I, you know, What I was doing there was running uh, biz dev, marketing, uh, doing kind of the growth hacking, things like managing transactional emails, partnerships with companies like Twitter or Dropbox or others, and to gain me- further distribution for our members' content. Yep. Um, but and then I narrowed all of our biz dev efforts on just a few strategics to go deeper. Um, okay. In that, with LinkedIn, that actually worked out very well. We ended up selling the company for 120 million a little bit over a year after I went over to SlideShare full time. And I often tell people that, well, first of all, companies are bought and not sold, but mm-hmm. the best acquisitions start as biz mm-hmm. dev deals. Right. Is that? It's at, you go for the best mm-hmm. thing is. Uh, as a business person, you want to try to make product. You want to make um, deals that are going to make sense and drive return in getting distribution for you. Some of it is acquiring intellectual property that you mm-hmm. may need, and forget about the other things like branding benefits and press release, partnership press releases, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, in the end, your real job is you want to align with the product manager, right? And when you have that alignment and that person sitting here going, okay, I've got my goals of what I want to accomplish in this year's plan, and I can see what I'm doing with this partner partnership, and it's starting to work, it's starting to grow in value. Like, um, even before I worked it, uh, you know, Link, SlideShare had an app on the LinkedIn platform when it was open for a very small amount of time for a set of like 10 partners. The SlideShare app was the most popular, right? right. So there was a proven, proven way in which people were using the two tools together. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it kind of came down to, as I think it mostly does, when a product manager can sit there and look at what their goals are and say, I can fulfill these goals better and or only uh, if I have this company as part of my company. Mm-hmm. And you have built up this case of, hey, we're doing a lot. Here are five things that we really should be doing together, but we can't do them because you're a different company than we are, right? And not even you don't even have to say that out loud, but let them think that and realize mm-hmm. uh, the syner- syner- obvious synergy is the thing that should. But drive LinkedIn them. at some point became this content network, mm-hmm. but back then I don't right. remember them being a content. So a network. a lot of this was, and yeah. I, this has been said publicly. Um, you know, LinkedIn realized a lot of social networks, so the primary driver of engagement and attention ends up being, uh, a lot of it ends up being content, right? Uh-huh. So in their content strategy, uh, they looked at SlideShare as one of the mechanisms of getting more content in that was of a professional nature uh-huh. um, to have people to prompt activity and conversations around, right? The vision that we came up with was uh, together SlideShare and LinkedIn will help you discover people through content uh-huh. and content through people. The integration, or what we did with the acquisition, I think took some steps towards that vision. Mm -hmm. I'd say um, there's a lot more that possibly could be done. In a lot of ways, we ended up doing a model after YouTube when Google acquired them, Mm -hmm. keeping it as an independent site, an independent business unit. It's something that makes a lot of sense so you don't crush an acquisition and disperse the engineering team and not really have the asset. But did you guys start working out of LinkedIn's offices? Uh, So we ended up keeping uh, the separate office, growing headcount modestly. Over time, we moved into a San Francisco office uh, that LinkedIn had, right? But that was over time. And we kept a lot of, um, and I think John and Rush, we really wanted this uh, to keep the same, a lot of the startup culture uh, mm-hmm. that still existed within uh, SlideShare. Uh, but in the end, like LinkedIn has such an amazing culture, you know, to be a part of. Like, if you get bought by a company, I would say that it is one of the better ones to end up working with, right? Why is that? How would you describe their culture? Um, so, uh, so Reed Hoffman invested in social text, and I watched the birth of it. I was the 57th person on LinkedIn, and mm-hmm. watch it evolve from you know coffee shop napkin material to mm-hmm. you know the m- monstrous, wonderful thing it is, right? Um, so the biggest what, mistake you made is not joining him then. There, I've thought of this before, <laughs> um, or Sorry. any of the other ones yeah. of all of my friends that started yeah. at the same time. I mean, it was hard to be on the doing, okay, we're the enterprise yeah. version of all this, mm-hmm. while well, those things are going in various directions. But, um, so what I'd say about LinkedIn, I've always been impressed about uh, the way that it is engineered, right? The mm-hmm. way that even the person down at the very bottom of the organization ends up having 
uh, greater awareness of what measurements they're affecting and where where those fit in context of the organization. Okay. Jeff uh, Weiner is an amazing CEO in the way that he communicates inside of the company. I think a lot of it's natural, right? They're selling initially, they were selling to HR, right? right. So they had to be great at talent management, mm-hmm. right? They had to be, you know, create a culture that valued people. And they borrowed some of the best practices that they possibly could as they're bringing some of the best HR talent, you know, to help shape their products and influence and uh, make their customers successful. Um, so in the end, you know, Link, I will say one funny thing. Reed Hoffman showed me a slide back in like the Verona Cafe that doesn't exist in Palo Alto before that had his little architecture of starting with profiles Mm -hmm. and then building up things on the stack. And I swear, like you look at things like, you know, they have the talent solutions, um, uh, marketing solutions and sales solutions, ways of generating revenue. Those things had been on that slide. I think he actually had the actual end. He mapped out his 20 year plan. Yeah, I think so. Um, so having had all this experience, watching the growth of consumer social, mm-hmm. Twitter, Facebook, mm-hmm. um, maybe business social, if we could call it that, LinkedIn, um, I guess Plaxo didn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you, what's next? What do you think? Is there a, I mean, I kind of think... Mm-hmm. Microsoft won't make if if Yammer had stayed independent, maybe they could have had a chance to be a big deal. But what do you think's next in enterprise, right. social, whatever? Right. Um, so I think I actually look at like Jive and Yammer and social text as mm-hmm. it exists and others. Unfortunately, when I look at them today, they're still they're getting a little bit crufty. I do mm. think that there's they're right crufty. crufty. Um, what is crufty? Well, you remember how you talked about how enterprise software is actually built when you have lots of customers yeah. pulling you sure. to do lots of features yeah. in lots of different ways. Um, it's re- you know I think at this point you did know, you make that word up? Is that a real word? Cruft. Yeah. And cruft is very common. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, but so. I do think that there's still there's some room there, and collaboration is always going to be an amazing market, right? Yeah. Um, I do think you know just in the same way that like you know Lotus Notes got crufty and yeah. things like that. Um, so I do think there's going to be another generation of that stuff, right? Um, I'd say you know uh, there's still room for business model experimentation. Mm-hmm. I'd say on the consumer, you know, I hate consumer work as a word, but um, on the stuff that everybody uses. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there. I think it's still relatively early. Yes, you have these large, um, almost monocultures like Facebook, right, that have subsumed so many wonderful things uh, into what their platform can do, and mm-hmm. has you know the dedicated focus of their attention at that unprecedented scale. But you still see there's new things that are social network like that rise up to promise. Snapchat, right? Uh, Snapchat's in play now. You just you know the Instagrams and whatever it may be. Um, and a lot of it may be, you know, there may be some new sensor data that comes in the phone, mm-hmm. right? That prompts something new, right? Like all of social software actually, uh, social networking, it happened at the same times that something happened on the phone. Flickr happened at the time when camera phones really started to become a little bit more mass market. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the most popular phone for power users at the time when Twitter took off, uh, people in the valley were using, you know, palms with mm-hmm. keyboards or Blackberries, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I always think there's some slight shift and some disturbance in the force over here creates a way of doing things differently and socially at a different scale than what, what, what exists. So before. maybe if you're thinking about starting a company in mm-hmm. 2015, right. try to monitor the trends mm-hmm. of, let's say, big platforms or big devices or how mm-hmm. consumers are using technology right. that might open up. Right a new paradigm of how people work. It's a common list to think through, right? So you definitely want to look at, you know, what are the latest things in new, in platforms Mm -hmm. uh, and in technologies that you can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Um, In those, I, you know, it's like entrepreneurship's experiment at the margin. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what the activity is. So you have to have a base of what you know, your hypothesis, your prototype. And there's something just at the edge of that, that something like on your phone Mm -hmm. starts to enable that makes the, that mark, it seems marginal at first makes the idea different, right? So that might be like a more product-centric way of exploring new ideas. More market-centric is, okay, well now smartphones are gonna be like, literally within a year or two, 
uh, throughout worldwide, you'll be able to get a phone as powerful as the one in my pocket, an iPhone or Android device, you know, for 25 bucks, mm -hmm. right? And for a lot of people, it's gonna be the first computer that they've ever used, if not touched, right? So the mark, you know, the scale of amount of users that are connected on the, on the internet and through these devices, um, the different ways of solving their problems, the way of reaching in and providing something that might be simpler uh, and marginal to what exists, but different. Uh, I think there's lots of very large scale opportunities. Like look at what WhatsApp did and all of the other, you know, chat apps that followed, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, whether you look at it in the end, at the beginning of starting a company, it's nothing but products and nothing but markets and trying to find a fit in between them. Um, just look at what these behavior, you know, scale shifts on the market is, um, geographic shifts, uh, and behavioral shifts, mm -hmm. right? When I say it's early in social software, I mean, right now, everybody knows how to take a picture and post something, how to look for comments and participate in conversation. They've given up all notions of, you know, keeping privacy. They're open to Privacy's new behaviors. Dead, yeah. Right. yeah. So I don't want to take up more yeah. of your time. Wonderful to have you in Los Angeles. It's so great to hear your stories because mm -hmm. again I think we've had a boom market since 09 mm -hmm. and I think there's a generation of people who don't remember how it was and it's right. uh, I always tell people when you're starting companies make sure to study your history try to learn from people who came before and and in many ways if you're young you really should reach out to people who have right. been around for 15 or 20 years because a lot of the lessons learned are right. repeatable exactly um, and as you know I'm uh, it's good to revisit all the history and what you can learn from it, you know, but I've not stopped. Right? Yeah. So I've got a stealth mode company. I'll look forward to talking about with you one day. Yes. And, uh, you know, we're hiring and we'll go make another You're already conversation. hiring people for your next yeah, thing. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, so, maybe the next time you come here, you'll talk about it. Okay. Sounds all right, great. Ross, thanks, thanks a lot. Take care. Okay.